thank you for the introduction. Can you all hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, so I'm really glad you're all here today, and I will tell you a little bit about um, touchable visualizations now. So it, it really ties in neatly with the whole responsive topic as well. Um, and first of all, you might be wondering, so who's this guy here? And a little bit about myself. I'm, my name is Dominikus Bauer, and I'm an interaction designer. And as you can see, I come from the beautiful city of Munich, Germany, um, which is known for the Oktoberfest and not much else, I guess. Um, <laughs> But uh, as you can see on this picture especially, is, um, Munich is very, very fruitful for intellectual endeavors. So <laughs> I spent a couple of years in academia before doing my own thing as a freelancer. And um, I worked in information visualization. And of course, the German accent helped with that career choice. <laughs> and as Irene already mentioned, I mostly worked in personal visualization. So what do we do with all the data that's collected about us? How can we make sense of that and bring it into a format that every one of us can understand? And um, here's one example, a project that I did with Frederick Seifert. And um, last history here takes a music listening history and your photos and your calendar entries and it merges all of them into a single timeline. And this way, you can explore the music that you've listened to and put it into the perspective of your life at that point in time. And it lets you reminisce based on that. And it even builds neat little slideshows out of the photos that you took at a certain point and the music that you listened to. So it's really fun. Um, and you can go check it out. It's still available online for free, even though it's Mac only. Sorry. Um, another project that I want to briefly touch on is virtual projection. And here we thought about the problem of small screens on portable devices, because they're really, really small, as we've, as we've seen in the previous talk. And this is one issue that's not bound to go away, unfortunately, even though phones seemingly know no limit when it comes to growing display size. Um, but the idea behind virtual projection was to provide an easy way to transfer from information from a handheld device to a stationary display. And what's easier than having a projector built into your phone? Um, here, in this project, however, everything is just simulated. So the phone and the display act as if the phone had a built-in projector. So the neat thing about that is that the whole thing works with regular iPhones and TVs, and all the magic only happens in software. And as the mobile device and the stationary display are still coupled and everything simulated, you have full control over the results. So you can, for example, use your handheld device as an interactive image filter just by moving it in front of the, of the large display. And you can also have these little uh, magic lens effects here where you see a satellite image on the handheld and you see the regular map on the large screen. OK, so that was some of my research work. but. Now I'm really excited by all these new fangled touch devices that have appeared in our bags and pockets and the chances that they give us, especially from a data visualization perspective. Okay, so quick survey, just to get you all awake again after lunch. Who here owns a touch controlled device of any kind? Okay, wow. <laughs> um, okay, but um, second question, who here has already developed some type of data visualization specifically geared towards touch-enabled devices? Oh, a few of you, cool. Okay, for the rest, um, I'm here to fix that. So I hope that after this talk, you have a clearer understanding of what you have to be aware of when you're designing for touch. Okay, so let's start at the start. And uh, this is probably going to get me in trouble, but I'll do it anyway. So what is data? whether it's small or big or whatever. Well, first of all, data means facts provided or learned about something or someone. So it's information on an object, a person, a process, etc. And so while we only recently started raving about the power of data, the concept has been around us always because um, data is information about our surroundings. It lets us find food and shelter and spot predators before they spot us and so on. Um, but how do you gather this data, this information about an object? Well, easy through visualization, of course. And conveniently, most objects provide us with an instant visualization of their properties. So just looking at this avocado here already gives you various infos about it, like its size, whether it has been damaged, and so on. Um, but in nature, it's mandatory to gather as much information about our surroundings as possible to increase the chances of survival, of course. So we're not only relying on a single sense, namely sight, but uh, we're using all of them. 
everything that we have available. And also most objects don't really tell us everything simply through their looks. So in this example here, if I asked you to tell me whether this avocado was ripe, what would you do? Well, I guess you would probably take it into your hand and gently squeeze it and you could feel if it was ripe. So um, this is what I mean with touchable visualizations. So visualizations that you can manipulate using only your fingers that you can examine, turn around through touch, um, but also, of course, do your regular data with stuff like filtering, highlighting, and so on. Um, and as we've just seen, it seems that supporting touch in your visualization will soon be a necessity as everybody uses touch control devices. Um, so as visualization designers, what do you have to be aware of in this case? So first, touchable visualizations are about interaction. So there's no need to panic if you only produce static images because they still work fine on tablets, just display them, and then we have these pinch to zoom gestures and so on to interact with them. So that's perfectly fine. Just treat them as images and you're all set. Um, second, even for interactive visualizations, touch support so far is mostly optional because often it's enough to just enlarge these buttons a little bit, make them easier to be touched, and you're all set. And um, while this explicit touch support isn't needed, in, I think it's definitely wasted potential if you're not thinking about that because your visualizations could become much more engaging and interesting when you're being aware of that. So um, here's a recent study by Drucker and colleagues from Microsoft Research, which was uh, published at Kai this year. And what they did was they compared two bar chart visualizations for tablets, one mainly controlled through gestures and the other using the regular good old button control panel. And the results of the study showed that not only people preferred the gesture controlled version, which was not too surprising, um, but their task performance was much better using gestures than buttons. So that's one thing to think about. And if I haven't convinced you yet, if you still need convincing, Hans Rosling here certainly looks like he would love his visualizations to be touch enabled. So think of him next time you design something. Okay, so anyway, what are some examples for touchable visualizations? What, what's out there? What can inspire you? So one of the first apps to integrate smart visualizations into an app was the companion app to Nicholas Felton's Datum. And Datum is a live logging service that lets you track anything. You can create your own items and categories and use it every time you do or eat or watch or think something. And the mobile app is, of course, a great addition to the service as you have your computer with you always pretty much. Um, but the app even lets you access and analyze your data. So the way this looks like, um, you can see that here. So we have a set of categories. And if, you, if you're interested in coffee, for example, if you want to see your coffee consumption in this app, um, you arrive at this screen here. And you have this little mini map at the bottom there that you can drag around to navigate within the data. And um, then you see these uh, stacked graphs appearing there at the top that show, give you an idea of the amount of coffee that you've consumed. And then you can tap up there to read the actual values. And uh, I think it's in milliliters or something, so don't be alarmed. <laughs> um, and that, that's a really neat app. It's great to use, and it's a lot of fun. Another example is Haiku Deck, and Haiku Deck is an app for the iPad that lets you create presentations. And while it, of course, has bullet points in there, like every great presentation has to, um, a great presentation also needs charts. And you can also add them in Haiku Deck. And the way this looks like um, is you can um, select a certain chart, and of course, you take the donut chart because it's the most powerful chart available. <laughs> and then you, you arrive at this interface here that lets you give a name to your chart and so on. But what's really nice is that you have these little, these little handles there that let you adjust the data in real time so you can touch on them and adjust that. And um, you can also add more sectors by tapping the plus in the middle. And um, one thing that might be a bug or a feature, I'm not sure, you can't create a donut chart that has more than 100%, which might be really annoying for people from Fox News, for example. So um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, don't use it if, if you're up for something like that. 
Okay, so these were two examples from commercial products and they of course come with their own restrictions to be practical, to have a market and so on. And we can find much more interesting examples of touchable visualizations in research, especially as researchers are really fond of these, these big ass tablets that they call interactive tabletops. And these tabletops, which should arrive in, our, in all of our living rooms any day now, are, <laughs> are naturally controlled through touch. So we need ways to interact with them. But um, of course, simply controlling things on a tabletop is trivial. Again, just make those buttons big enough. The power lies in those much more interesting things that we can do through touch. And here's one example from the University of Calgary that was published at ITS. And uh, this visualization here is a reservoir vis visualization. So it's uh, geological data. You have these layers. And um, you can use your fingers to peel them apart and look within that 3D visualization at the underlying layers. And you can hold parts with one hand and uh, move stuff with the other. And you can, even, um, you can even peel these layers and flip them like the pages of a book, um, all the while while being in 3D. So this is, a, this is a really great use of touch, I think. And it's, it's a very powerful idea to be able to manipulate your data in that way. OK. So I hope that after these examples, you're excited to learn a bit more about interaction design for touchable and also mobile devices. Um, you can't really separate the two cleanly yet. Um, there aren't really that many examples of touchable visualizations yet, so I will mostly talk about general app design. But the recommendations and guidelines still apply, of course, if, you're, if you have touch and visualization in your app. OK. Um, so you want to develop this touchable visualization, let's call it an app, and you're wondering what things you have to think about and what do you have to be aware of. And the most important aspect and one that you're probably familiar with from your own experience is the fat finger problem. So evolution obviously hasn't shaped us for typing on small pieces of glass, unfortunately. Um, so when designing for touch, we have to take that into account and make these buttons big enough again. And all developer guides suggest slightly different sizes, but they're all around 45 pixels squared or 90 pixels squared for retina displays. And so what this means is that if we have an iPad with a resolution of 1024 by 768 pixels, um, then you can't really put an interface like that on there and still expect people to be able to use it. So um, go easy on the buttons. Um, also, not only the fingers are fat, but also the hands. So if you have smart animations that convey information, don't rely on them being visible, because there might be a pair of hands within the sight of the user and the screen. So that could be occluded. And finally, handheld devices are much more flexible in their use than desktops. And portrait and landscape orientations here are only the most obvious usage modes. So whether an app works with a thumb or requires two hands also makes a huge difference. And you've probably all had these situations where you wanted to look up something on Google Maps and you tried zooming with only one hand, which is just not very pretty. So the fat finger problem, the occlusion problem, and the question of usage mode all belong to ergonomics, the limitations that the physical world puts on all people interacting with your app. You should be aware of them when designing touch areas and transitions and, of course, applying interaction techniques. Um, a second set of considerations are contextual ones. So interaction design was really great back in the days when everybody was sitting in front of their PCs um, because not much was happening around them. But nowadays, interaction can happen pretty much everywhere. We all carry these little portable computers around and drag them out in pretty much every situation. And um, so you, as interaction designers, have to be aware of the various situations in which a handheld device might be used. And of course, it's not only location. It's more and more also the social context. Who are people currently with while interacting with your app? And are they trying to pass the time? Or are they looking for relevant information and are in a hurry and so on? So context, social location marks concern number two for the touchable visualization designer. And finally, a last thing. Um, again, a question for all of you. I won't let you sleep, sorry. So how do you enlarge this photo? What do you do? Right, yeah. Exactly, you, you pinch it. You use this pinch to zoom gesture. Um, now, 
Isn't that weird? I mean, when was the last time you pinched an actual photo? And what I'm more interested in is what did it do in response? It probably didn't zoom. So um, this, is, this is a third set of considerations, which is convention. So you have to be aware of them. People expect to be able to zoom stuff by pinching, for example, which is somewhat um, arbitrary, but it just it still exists. And there's also stuff like horizontal swiping for deleting items and um, double tapping for zooming in. So if you design your app, um, never ever design counter to these conventions because you'll only frustrate people. Okay, so these are kind of the three uh, rock bottom parts that you have to think of when designing for, um, for touch. Keeping these in mind is paramount and it leads you to designing a good app, but the question is how do you design a great app? And that's where this lady here comes in. That's the person using your app. And to make your app really great, you have to put yourself in her shoes. Why is she using your app? What is she trying to accomplish? In other words, what's her task? So is she doing some really crazy scientific um, data analysis? So trying to figure out a trend or development over time or something very complicated and lean forward? Or um, is it more about lounging on the couch and playing around with your personal data, trying to relive your last vacation or looking up a song from your listening history. So um, the, the current task that the person is trying to achieve using your app is definitely very important. And then there's another thing, another aspect that is especially pressing with touch controlled visualizations, which is discoverability. So this here is a screenshot of Figure, which is an amazing synthesizer app for the iPhone. And it's, it's really fun to create little musical pieces with it. But if you look at the interface, what parts of it can you press? You probably can't tell me um, right now without actually using the app. And you also can't tell what happens when you press them. What will you break when you press the wrong button? And you might get away with things like that in a more artistic app that um, where pretty much every interaction leads to something interesting. But um, discoverability is a much bigger problem for other types of apps. Then when you think about the person you're developing for, you also have to know that this app that you're building is completely alien to her. When you think back to the issues with Fat Fingers, we haven't really evolved to navigate virtual spaces either, unfortunately. So orientation is also tricky in software. We're freed from any restrictions that the physical world gives us. So we as designers can go totally crazy, do whatever we, will, we like. But really, what this mainly does is confuse the person in front of the screen and uh, quickly lost in our virtual world and become frustrated. So orientation is also a very interesting and important <coughs> aspect. Okay. And finally, after all these issues and problems, there's one last thing that you should never ever forget, and it's probably the most important thing, which is let people have fun. Let them play instead of work, add things that are unnecessary but enjoyable um, to create a really great app. And another more serious aspect of that is be forgiving when it comes to mistakes. So don't delete an email draft because of one misplaced swipe, for example. Okay, so that was probably um, a lot to take in, but you're not the first ones to build applications. So there are thousands of inspiring examples out there that you can scrutinize for nice little design ideas. Um, and we've actually come a long way since Apple started this whole App Store madness in 2008. And really in these five years, so much has happened with app design and mobile interaction design that some of these apps that were fantastic back in 2008, um, have reached something that I like to call the, the GeoCities point. So this, this effect is something that looked amazing um, just a couple of years back, uh, somehow seems a bit weird right now and somewhat outdated. Um, so here's some of the best apps from 2008, the year the App Store started and only five years ago. And they still work great today, of course, but they, well, they look a little bland. So um, especially colors are uh, somewhat um, reluctant and we have lists, so we have lists everywhere. And it's not only the information architecture and the graphic design, it's also the interaction design itself. So everything rests on well-defined screens and you navigate between them and you have all these buttons. And Here's some apps from 2013, um, so five years later. 
Um, they still look somewhat the same, especially Facebook and Instagram, um, but the content is very different. So while we still have lists, text is no longer the main element. Photos are front and center, and also tabs have become much more subtle and have morphed into more interesting controls. And also the action no longer happens on clearly separated screen, but we have multiple layers of information and spatial organization of that. Um, now I wanna show you a couple of examples how app designers have addressed these four aspects that we had before of discoverability, task, orientation, and fun. And probably the most important concept regarding touchable interfaces is direct manipulation. And direct manipulation means that on-screen elements are manipulated directly simply by touching them instead of touching a button or um, using some other external control. And um, I don't know if you've, you've seen these initial versions of the Maps application on Android phones because they didn't use direct manipulation for zooming, for example. So we had these buttons there at the bottom um, and they were really hard to hit and you sometimes hit them um, not on purpose and it was, it was somewhat frustrating. But since then, of course, Android has also gone to using pinching for zooming, which is much easier to use. Another aspect that is often used is physicality, so behavior from the real physical world. Um, so many apps by now have this drag down to refresh metaphor. So that's not only fun to pull it off, but it's also really useful and it works really well because you have this huge touch area that you can use to refresh instead of just a tiny button somewhere. When it comes to orientation, I really like Evernote's iPhone app. Evernote lets you take down notes and organize them. And to keep them all neatly organized, they are put into virtual folders. And all of these folders are put into, put into a file cabinet here. Um, and by tapping the title bar, you can access this main navigation and move to other places. And you have this any, these animated transitions that clearly show you where you are currently, so you're never lost in this virtual space, but you can always see where you are in which part of the app, and you can always go back. And uh, similarly, while we had clear transitions between screens before, now everything's tied together, as in Facebook's app, for example, where the sidebar menu visibly lies behind its main activity list. So it's no longer on separate screens, but they're, they're behind each other. Okay. <coughs> and finally, a lot of aspects of apps are geared towards fun. The graphics are appealing, and certain aspects are simply useless in the best sense of the word. And um, my favorite recent example for that are Facebook Facebook's chat hats. I don't know if you've seen them. Um, but in the Facebook app, if somebody sends you a message, they appear as little circles there. And um, you can tap on these circles, of course, to actually read the message, but you can also just toss them around on the app. It's, it doesn't fit any purpose. It doesn't do anything useful, but you can use the hats of your friends and toss them around in the app. I mean, that's, <laughs> weren't you all waiting for that? Okay, so, so this is a really nice touch. Great little thing, completely useless, and just a lot of fun. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so now we know about the most important things to keep in mind when designing for touch, and we've seen some inspiring examples. But uh, the question is, where do you, how do you get started? What do you start from? So uh, do you just have a couple of ideas and try to tie them together somehow? And um, especially, how do you make something as abstract as data visualization tangible so that people can use that, that um, this discoverability and orientation, for example, aren't um, such big problems? And, um, and a good way to do that is to put your app on some solid standing, some solid ground, which is mostly a metaphor. So, um, one thing that's easy to forget, especially since we have whole conferences organized about it, is this, that computer interfaces don't actually exist. So they're, they're really here for a moment, and you can click on them and tap around in them, but uh, if the power is gone for, say, 24 hours, um, then all of your crazy devices turn back into the, the black little mirrors that they are. And because these interfaces are so so strange to us, we need metaphors to make sense of them. 
So the internal workings of the machine are completely alien to us anyway, so we um, take these ideas from the physical world to make them understandable for us. And one great definition of metaphor is in Lakoff and Johnson's work, Metaphors We Live By. And um, I quote, the, the essence of metaphor is understanding and experiencing one kind of thing in terms of another, which I think neatly sums it up. And we can never hope to understand the way that a computer works or think in the same way, and that's why we need them. We need metaphors. Um, and one could even argue that that's all that data visualization, for example, is, understanding and experiencing data in terms of visual representations. Um, but of course, when I mention metaphor and tablets in the same sentence, you might immediately think of something like this here, the way we organize our contacts in neat little address books, and the way we write down notes on little virtual legal pads, and the way we play games on little gambling tables with green felt and all. And then you might think of the insult of the day that was invented when fanboys needed a big word to throw around, and everyone soon centered on skeuomorphism to describe Apple's tendency to overly cling to some physical object for a digital interface. Well, originally, the word skeuomorph only describes ornaments to make an object look like it was made with a different technique. For example, this great, this really fantastic station wagon here that features some fake wood panels as a reminder of the glory days um, when cars actually had parts made of wood. And I think the actual reason that people have become so frustrated with Apple's design is that there's a mismatch at the core of these apps. And the source of this frustration is that metaphor comes in two flavors. Metaphor is for one, the visual metaphor, so what physical object your app looks like, and on the other hand, the interaction metaphor or behavioral metaphor, so what your app acts and feels like. And there's no better way to frustrate people than to show them this, but not let them flip the page, especially when that's perfectly doable in another app on the same device by the same software company that looks the same like a book. And here you can flip the pages and you can in the contacts app. Um, so a well-applied metaphor neatly solves all of your issues of task. So imagine you're reading a book on a piece of glass. That's, that's a clear task. Um, discoverability, well, you know how to turn pages of a book and you just do it the same. Um, orientation, you're well aware of where you are in the book, how, much more, how many more pages are coming and so on. And finally, fun, because hey, it's a, it's a book on a tablet. Isn't that amazing? Um, so, Okay, so these were kind of the, the basics of, of touch interaction design, and I want to make those points clearer with a concrete example. I want to talk about a little project that I did with Bong Shen Li and Sheila Carpendale, which is called TouchWave. And with TouchWave, we tried to turn an existing visualization technique, namely stacked graphs, into a touchable visualization. And you will see how all of the design aspects that I've explained before um, come into this design. So just first, just a brief recap. So the basic idea behind stacked graphs, um, the stream graph is probably the most popular incarnation, is to take some um, area charts that all share the same horizontal axis, for example, time, and stack them on top of some arbitrary baseline and on top of each other. So imagine layer one and layer two here are stocks, and the charts show their values over time. And by stacking them on top of each other, you can also read the sum of them at the same time which is pretty neat. But there's also some heated debate around stacked graphs and whether anybody in their right minds should use them because they have quite some problems. So the main issue is probably how bad we as people are at reading curves. And uh, some of you will probably laugh when I ask you to tell me which of these curves here grows faster, A or B, because, well, they're actually the same curve. But it's really hard to see. And of course, that is a main problem, especially for these curvy things called stack graphs. And similarly, it's very hard to compare parts of stack graphs visually or make sense of them when there's, say, more than 30 layers. But that's all on, that only applies to the static form. So interaction neatly solves that, as we see in the, in the fantastic baby name Voyager here, for example. So stacked graphs make a perfect target for our touchification of graphs. And um, we, of course, started with a metaphor. 
and we had this idea of the graph as dough or clay, so as some, some moldable material that you can shape with your hands. And then we spent a lot of time sketching and playing with that idea in our heads. And we had to boil it down to something that didn't only adhere to the metaphor that we had in our heads, but also something that was usable and at the same time overcame the restrictions of the visualization technique that we had picked. So we ended up with a couple of general concepts. So f the first was um, physicality. So our graph should become a physical object and act like one. Um, which was kind of the central aspect. And as you probably know from your experience with physical objects, they don't just appear or disappear. They have a certain continu continuity to them. So all changes and transitions should reflect that. Elements just can't disappear. Um, and another thing, when, it, when the touch comes in the graph or the virtual object, should react like a physical object to touch. So this helps with discoverability, of course. Um, but while designing something like that, you also have to think of the interaction conventions of the platform. So the pinch to zoom, for example. And finally, as this playroom is scarce and fingers are fat, um, why not tie all functionality to the graph itself? And we wanted to completely skip buttons and map everything to manipulations of the virtual object or directly touching somewhere else. OK, so here's the result. And coming straight from this metaphor of the visualization as a virtual object, it was clear that people should be able to directly transform that object. They should be able to grab layers, drag them out, reorganize them, and do all of that simply through touch. And that's also something new that resulted from the touchable version, the option to uh, reorganize layers in a stack graph, which is uh, very rare in other systems. I'm not. I'm not aware of any that do that. Um, but it's, it's very easy and natural and fun here. But then also just mindlessly sticking with a metaphor isn't everything. It's also about usability and task and conventions and so on. Um, so for zooming and focusing on parts of the graph, we relied on the existing convention and used the pinch to zoom gesture. Of course, a bit modified as there, as you see, there are no parts of the graph disappearing when you zoom but it, it's actually reshaping and you can still see everything, so you still keep the context. But that's, that's still not how dough, for example, would react to such a treatment if you stuck two fingers in it. Um, and also another convention, you can get rid of all these manipulations by swiping horizontally, which is, again, arbitrary, but convention. And finally, sometimes you need to convey precise information, for, be, for example, to be able to compare the values of layers at a certain point. And if we had a device capable of haptic feedback and be able to simulate friction, then we might map that to that. But um, of course, it's much cleaner if um, to just show the explicit values. So if you touch anywhere on the graph or outside of it, um, these little vertical rulers here appear, and they let you read if the resolution was higher, they would let you read the actual values of the graph. And you can also use multiple fingers to do that. And uh, what's also great, they appear every time you touch anywhere. So you can use that to compare parts of the graph just by dragging out the layers and um, putting them on top of each other. OK, so much for the interaction in TouchWave. Another challenge that we faced and that I probably should have mentioned earlier when it comes to touchable visualizations is how to implement them. Um, as unfortunately, I mean, some of you are probably aware of that, our tablets and smartphones aren't really as capable and powerful as our other computers yet. But um, the first thought that we had when starting with TouchWave was, of course, we're, we're using the web. We have all these powerful JavaScript libraries, and it's going to be just beautiful, and it's going to run on iOS and Android and PCs and Macs and, and Google Glass and fridges, and uh, it's going to be awesome. But one thing that, um, so we looked at D3, obviously, and one thing that we really liked in this D3 example here were these seamless transitions. So how this graph is morphing into another one, and we thought it was just perfect for our purposes, but of course, um, it wasn't meant to be, so this video here was taken with my laptop. And this is the same thing running on the iPad. 
And um, if you look closely, you can see an animation there, but um, it's very subtle. So <laughs> it's, it's just not the same. And um, so we ended up just writing a native app based on Apple's core graphics and core animation frameworks. And those are hardware accelerated and they perform really nicely. And um, if you look closely, you can see these, these little transitions of the graph and so on, um, which is just what we, what we wanted to have. But of course, um, I'm really sorry for the bad news when it comes to the web. Um, so I have a kitten here. <laughs> um, but I have high hopes that that will change in the near future. So we have things like WebGL, for example, and hardware acceleration in the browser. And once that moves to tablets, then I guess we're all set and our beautiful D3 visualizations should work again. Okay, so um, at the end of my talk, where are we going with these touchable visualizations to look a little bit into the future? So will the future of data be little physical sculptures, 3D prints of our data that we can actually touch? Or will we play around with our food and create data visualizations out of it? And what will it taste like? And how many Facebook friends do you need to get a tasty cocktail? Um, or will we interact with our data in virtual realities and look like, completely dor like complete dorks while doing it? Um, I guess we will find out. Thank you. Any questions? How difficult was to develop this, uh, this chart and the interactions in iOS compared to doing the same in iOS? OK, that's, that's a great, great question. So how difficult was it um, to develop natively instead of using the web frameworks? Um, we had a lot of overhead in there. So we had to write a lot for data manipulation, of course, and also create the pretty much everything from scratch. Um, I actually ported the, um, the great stream graph library by um, Martin Wattenberg um, and colleagues and ported that to, to Objective-C so I could use it on the iPad. So the, the drawing was easier, but of course we didn't have much help. So I'm, I'm not aware of any data viz frameworks for the iPad. There might be some, but it's not as, um, as great as for the web, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but recently Firefox uh, released a demo of uh, uh, Unity Engine uh, where they are playing, you basically can play uh, something like Unreal, uh, like a game uh, powered by the Unreal uh, directly in your browser because their JavaScript can now be compiled uh, directly into C. Okay. Uh, and so I'm wondering if that would be possible with uh, to to make it happen on, on a tablet, which would mean that, that we can now run JavaScript that then uh, uh, can, can directly access the hardware. Okay, um, I, I think that's that's actually the main reason that that stuff isn't working on tablets yet. That this hardware acceleration is missing because the graphics chips are actually pretty pretty powerful even on tablets. I mean, just look at the games that you have on the iPad, for example. So. Um, if you could use something like that and compile your JavaScript to C and run it more or less natively on the machine, even if you have the browser layer in between, I think that, yeah, that could help a lot. So I guess, um, so TouchWave is probably going to be, hopefully, one of the last native examples and the rest can use the web. Yep. Sorry, what was the last part? Oh, how closely does the visual metaphor have to be tied to the interaction metaphors in mm. order for the app to be easy to understand? Okay, so the question was how close do the visual and the interaction metaphor have to be to, um, to actually work? And um, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, you probably don't want to replicate the whole behavior of a physical object just to adhere to some metaphor. Um, but you always have to make sure that the most obvious things that people would like to do with a certain object should work, like flipping a page, for example, especially if you, I mean, the contact, Contacts app is a great example because it's, 
it's so obviously broken in this regard. Um, you probably shouldn't support everything, and you don't have to, but the, as I said, probably the, do the most important interactive things, and um, then you have this, this benefit of letting people easily discover the functionality. Um, so we, we haven't in this project here. Um, so are you talking about general gesture controlled interfaces? So mapping gestures to any interaction? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, so there are some frameworks out there, I think even for, for JavaScript, for example. So you can also use that um, in your browser-based applications. Um, of course, gestures always face this problem of discoverability because um, how do you discover that you're supposed to draw a circle or a pentagram or whatever um, without anybody actually telling you? So I'm, I'm a bit torn about gestures, to be honest. So I'm not really sure if, if it's such a great idea to overly rely on them. Um, but of course, you can. You can have help screens, you can have little animated tutorials when starting the app for the first time. So I think um, you can definitely use gestures, but probably should go easy on them. Um, Actually, we already have WebGL on the iPad, um, but only for the ads, unfortunately. So it's actually supported there, but only if, if your visualization or your app is running in this little ad banner in the browser. So um, there is no technical restriction that keeps Apple from allowing WebGL in the browser, but they just haven't done it yet. I have no idea why. But I, I think it will happen pretty soon. I mean, it's already supported on Android tablets, so it's just a matter of time, a year maybe. Alrighty. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.